well, let's go ahead and get get rolling. More folks are going to be coming in. Um, uh, but first, just for the sake of the recording, everybody coming in. Uh, my name is Kali Akuno. Uh, I'm with the uh, Institute for Social Ecology. Many of you also know me from my work with Cooperation Jackson. Uh, so I want to thank you all to our ongoing interview uh, series uh, about um, uh, race and uh, racial justice uh, and climate change, climate justice uh, that we're doing with the Center, the Institute for Social Ecology. Um, hopefully, you all checked out, you know, the series we did with Max Out on uh, a People's Green New Deal that was prepped for this uh, interview about uh, the COP26 and many of the challenges that, uh, at least in my view, <laughs> come along with that process. Um, and with us today, we are uh, blessed to have uh, Benicia Albert with us from uh, Climate Justice Alliance. Uh, many of you may know Benishi for years and years of work um, in the Southwest um, with IEN. Uh, um, we've just recently, over the past couple of years, gotten the opportunity to start knowing each other, but I've known of Benishi's work long, long before that with uh, um, uh, Southwest Workers Project and some many other things that were going on that were close allies to some of the work uh, that I was doing and folks I, I knew of. Uh, so reputation always uh, preceded her, but now just getting the pleasure of, of actually working with her. Um, um, Benishi is uh, one of the co-executive directors uh, of the Climate Justice Alliance, and it is going through, uh, I think, a remarkable uh, process of kind of democratizing the workplace and, and broadening out, um, you know, how how it's making uh, uh, decisions. I think is uh, a model of of how many uh, other social justice organizations can kind of divide some things up and and develop from within. So I just want to highlight that for the good work I think that uh, Climate Justice Alliance is actually doing. Um, so folks, you know, check it out when you get a chance. Um, but yeah, I just want to now just hop into it because I think um, we could talk about this, I think the two of us all day uh, and go back and forth. Uh, but, you know, there's a couple of core questions uh, I wanted to really get somewhat to the heart of it. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, which is about just the, the nature and the challenges of the COP process. Now, in, in my view, as uh, I've shared, Benicia, you know, my view, I've seen uh, that particularly over the last decade, you know, the COP process. And for those of you who aren't familiar with COP, let me state that that's the Conference of Parties, uh, um, uh, uh, the UN, the United Nations um, process to get the nation states uh, to work in collaboration to take on climate change, right? And so uh, this year in Glasgow was Glasgow, Scotland, uh, was the 26th iteration of this COP process, um, you know, just so everybody's clear. And in my view, um, I think particularly the last 10 years, uh, the transnational corporations have really just captured this process. It seems to me like since uh, really, since they've really doubled down and and reorganized and just really ramped through their agenda, right, uh, through this entire process. And this one seemed like they really solidified a number of things uh, that were that have been floating around, but they definitely solidified like their uh, uh, position within this whole entire thing. Um, and so, I want to to you know, for those of us who have always been, I think, you know, critical of this process, uh, been trying to challenging this, this uh, uh, process, you know, like um, in your view, you know, um, why are we still engaging this? Why is it is, is important uh, to still kind of engage in this, in this process? Like what are the pros and cons of it as you see it? Uh, particularly this, this last one and, and how they were really trying to uh, what is the Article Six and trying that, and and you know really set up the carbon markets, uh, deny human rights, etc. 
um, but we're still knocking at the door. So um, break that down for us. Why? Why are we still there? Oh, there's any number of reasons why we're still there. Um, so yeah, let me just first say, um, you know, I, I, my name is Benishi Albert. Um, I am Yuchi and Anishinaabe. Uh, I make my, my home is in my home community is in Oklahoma, um, Yuchi Muscogee territories. Although uh, also known as Tulsa, I live in Tulsa, but um, this is also relocated territories for us. You know, our original homelands were much further southeast, um, Tennessee, the Carolinas, Alabama, Georgia. So, um, and, but yeah, that's, this is where my home, um, my home people, my peoples are at. Um, but I was in New Mexico for, gosh, nearly a quarter of a century. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, did a lot of organizing there. But my organizing roots started here in Oklahoma um, and mostly with local family and community organizing here in Oklahoma and, and around environmental justice. Um, and so, you know, for me, I, there were a good, I, I would say a good number of decades that I stayed away from the, the international UN work. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that initially is because, you know, I felt like there was enough going on locally um, that had my hands full and then add to that national coalition building solidarity work. That was a lot. Um, so in my, you know, late teens, early 20s, you know, or most of my 20s and 30s, I was just like, no, I'm not interested in international work. There's enough people doing that and holding that. Um, but you know, even, even for the people that were holding it, um, and, you know, my initial experience with the UN work, um, you know, was through an indigenous perspective, um, and the people that were holding it were holding it from a perspective of, you know, uh, in indigenous communities need to be recognized as independent sovereigns um, and should be recognized with the United Nations. So that was their participation and, you know, stayed connected to that through the work here in Oklahoma. Um, but also in New Mexico with some of the leadership that have been participating over the years. Um, but, you know, as, as the work that I was doing around environmental justice started focusing on in a lot more around climate change, um, this climate change process with the UN um, became more evident that we needed to have grassroots leaders um, and, and community leaders indigenous knowledge holder and, and be part of the process. So the UN process is, you know, the United Nations framework on convention of climate change or something like that, you know, the UN triple C, UNF triple C. Um, and, you know, the reason that, um, you know, it's necessary for grassroots community people um, to be there is that one, world leaders are making decisions on our behalf, right? And so we should make sure that we tell them how they should be orienting themselves on making decisions on our behalf. Um, two, much of, much of the carbon pollution that is produced are from corporations who are, whose headquarters are based in the US um, and corporations who are causing a great deal of harm um, to um, people of color worldwide, um, and specifically a good number in the global South. Um, and then, you know, three, like we, we should always be holding, you know, um, not only holding our elected officials accountable, um, but also lifting up voices of grassroots communities. Cause that's where, that's where really the solutions that are, are, we need to be investing in are happening. And, and much of those communities are doing that without help or support from their governments, um, but are doing uh, solutions that are making real gains. And we need to make sure that is heard at the UN. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, those are, those are the sort of main reasons why, you know, I um, in, engage in it. And to be honest, you know, like, even though there's been a, a great deal of sort of international solidarity of work that I've um, done or participated in, 
um, in the last 20 years around environmental justice. The UN space is kind of a newer space for me. This is only the second COP that I've participated in. Um, I went to the last COP in Madrid um, and then uh, this one in Glasgow. Um, and, you know, but from all accounts of, of um, leaders and mentors and, and other organizing folks that I've been in relationship with who have participated in the COPs in the past, not much has changed um, since it started in uh, 1995 or something back, you know, back that far. So, um, you know, there's definitely a sort of business as usual kind of um, feel that you you definitely is definitely palpable when you're in in that space so and and business as usual being um you know focusing on addressing climate change through an economic lens um that's the business as usual that i feel that i've i've been like it's always a focus about the economic lens it's never been a focus about um the health and well-being of our communities the health and well-being of the land and mother earth it's always been about the health and well-being of oil and gas fields. And, you know, that's pretty apparent when you're in that space. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a fan um, of the, the culture bomba process, right? And the, the big supporter of the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth that came out of that. And for those of you who don't know, aren't familiar with that, that's a process uh, which is about a decade old now, right? Um, um, you know, but, but for the most part, our movements have not continued, like in a, in a formal way. I know many of us still use and cite, you know, the, the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, but being connected directly with each other, like in, a, in an alternative form, we haven't kept that up. Um, do you think we need to in some other form? Like, do we need another space outside of just the UN space uh, to really uplift our own solutions um, and to build our own, own power? You know, that's a, that's a, Fundamental question I'm asking all of our folks now if I, I want to put on on our radar screens and put our thinking caps on. So what's your thought on, on that one, Benicia? Uh Yes and yes. <laughs> um, you know, even even at the U.S., even in Glasgow, right, there's there are these parallel spaces, right? There's there's the indigenous Minga. There's the People Summit. There are these parallel spaces. Um, that are happening um, alongside the UN. Some of them in collaboration, like the UN knows that you know you have to go through this process and get them on there. Those are spaces where there's some real um, work being done around um, the solutions, sharing those, sharing strategy, sharing some thinking and philosophy about that. Um, you know, that you know, education, popular education around that. Um, and so there's some important there's some important work happening there. The challenge is is how to get that information that's happening there into those negotiating rooms at the UN, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I I would say, yeah, I think you know I think we need to continue to push the mechanism itself, you know, the UNF Triple C itself to um, engage. Um, you know, frontline communities and frontline being those who are living with the impacts of climate change right now, today. Um, and, and that is both, you know, the environmental impacts of like weather change, loss of land, you know, drought, relocation, all of that. And then the direct effects of living along the fence line of Purdue polluting industry, right? Those communities who are living like where, you know, corporations are, are polluting their groundwater, who are polluting their ground. Literally, people can light their lawns on fire um, because of the fuel that's been um, leaked into their neighborhoods. So 
you know, we have to figure out like how to take that those processes, those parallel processes, um, and how to functionally input them into like the 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 UN the UN space. Um, and because I think there's really like there's really good work that's happening there. And and there are people who are traversing both of those spaces. You know, in Glasgow, we had a delegation um, with it takes roots, you know, this coalition of four organizations, Climate Justice Alliance, Indigenous Environmental Network, Grassroots Global Justice, and Right to the City, um, you know, took a, a delegation there of 60 plus folks. And I would say half of them were able to have pass, delegate passes into the UN. The other half of folks were holding space in these other people spaces, right, popular spaces. Um, and, you know, that's where like the dynamic work that is happening around like solutions and strategies and thinking, I mean, even connecting with the people of Glasgow and the people of Scotland around colonization and occupation and, and land back, you know, they even have some thinking about land back strategy and pushing back against colonial rule. <laughs> Right. And so that was really interesting intersections to make. Um, and, you know, but thinking about, you know, not only the, the sort of structure and form and how to make that happen, there's also the intention of those spaces. Um, and so, again, for me, that intention is about um, centering land and people as opposed to centering economy and profit. Right. And so that, you know, that Cochabamba process, um, you know, included a centering of the rights of Mother Earth. Right. And, and, and saying we need to we need to resolve this climate crisis from the perspective of the rights of Mother Earth, the rights of nature, the rights of river, the rights of forest. And what does that mean? Um, and, you know, for, for me, that is both a ideological shift for the UN, but it's also an ideological shift for society in general. And, and, you know, I always make this critique about US society, but it's pretty preve prevalent in other communities that, you know, <clears throat> when colonization came to this hemisphere, one of the things they brought with them is this concept of dominion, right? Man over nature, man over land. And so land is a commodity to be traded and negotiated with or acquire. You know, the whole thing of coming here was about acquisition of land to build political power for different countries, right? They were all in this competition of who could own the most stuff. And at that point, the most stuff was land. Um, and so that concept came to this hemisphere. Um, and, and prior to that, the, the sort of thought process is that man is not above land, like it's in equal relationship to land. Um, and, you know, it's not a like, you know, like warm and fuzzy philosophical thing that like indigenous people think, but it really is a worldview about relationship to land. And so if you feel like you are equal to land, you make policy decisions differently than if you think you are owner of land. It's, it, it's a fundamental mental shift. So if you're thinking about policies from a place of ownership of land, those policies are dramatically different than if you're thinking about, I am equal to land, I need to make decisions about the land that will have direct impact on me. I need to make decisions that will have impact on me that will have a direct relationship to land. Your policy decisions then are different. And that's the shift that I think the Cochabamba process was trying to get, you know, a larger movement space, solidarity space to think about. It's like, how do we think about and orient ourselves in a place of land and relationship of land that is not about dominion but about sort of uh, equal relationship to um, and so that sort of theoretical process 
absolutely. I think we need to, you know, get a whole movement to sort of align behind that, you know, and, you know, that gets categorized as like in, you know, popular culture gets categorized as like tree huggers or like, you know, we're not being realistic. We're not like whatever. And I, and I'm, and, and because I come from that worldview, right. When I, when I see policies that lead with an economic intention, that seems unrealistic to me, right? That seems vastly unrealistic to me to say, we're going to solve an environmental crisis through an economic strategy. Like, it's just not going to work. I'm like, I don't, like, I don't, it seems so basically fundamentally, like, simple to understand. And yet, you know, that kind of thinking that I have, people are telling me, oh, I'm being unrealistic. And I'm like, well, so be it. We just are, have different views about how to resolve this situation. I don't think we're going to resolve the situation through economic means. However, I think if we actually invest in the kind of projects that are happening and invest in them locally and structurally, we're deconstruction, deconstructing the whole of like all these big multinational corporations are holding these you know, different solutions or different energy sources or grids. And we break that down to be held locally um, with local control. They're connected to land base. They're connected to community. They're, they have community control and in, 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 you know, in investment and in design and in oversight. I think if you have a multitude of those and invest in that, the economy will follow, right? Like that then localizes economy and localizes access, localizes what people can hold and have access to. Um, and, and I feel like that kind of regenerative economy is what we should be investing in. I may have jumped ahead, but- um... Oh, no, 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 that's fine. <laughs> uh, um, I do want to come go back just a little bit though. Um, to talk about like the inside outside. I've done both, you know, just, just so folks know, you know, I've, I've been to, wow, this is even scary to put out there. Um, 10 of the 26 uh, uh, cops, this would have been, if I would have, uh, health would allow, this would have been my 11th one. Um, so that may be more a question for myself than anybody else, but, um, uh, the the kind of the inside outside strategy um, that is a critical juncture that we have to figure out how to do better a lot better um, in order to challenge this this the um, the, the the reign of the dominion mindset right um i think it's going to take some more acute crisis to get there um but we need to be organized for when those moments occur and they will occur and they're occurring much more rapidly actually um we need to be organized to intervene um, and the, the, I can say that, um, the, the forces I see the most effective, uh, over the past, definitely, I would say 15, maybe even 20 years, uh, have been indigenous, you know, forces from around the globe, figuring out, you know, how to interject, how to intervene. Uh, and I think there's some lessons there, you know, to be, to be, taught and to be shared. Um, and one of them, it seems to me, entails um, shifting that mind frame, right? Because uh, I know a lot of our movements and that even a lot of the, the, the movement frameworks um, are kind of situated in, you know, maybe at best about changing who owns land who owns a means of production but it's still in an ownership framework it hasn't necessarily 
transcended that, right? It just changes who, who does the owning or who has the possession. Um, and so I think it's going to require a shift. So I, I, if you can, from what you know, Benicia, just, just speak to, um, in particular, how indigenous communities came to uh, uh, organize. You know, I think that's one of the key lessons a lot of folks, a lot of other communities are trying to figure out to engage this process. Uh, uh, but to be able to have the, like an impact, you know, because uh, a lot of people, you know, and I'm, I'm raising this because a lot of, a lot of, a lot of what we hear in a lot of our, our kind of movement circles of late is that, you know, uh, we have to, to reach a critical mass, right? Like, you know, we have to, what's the sunrise form or something? We have to be 5% of the population, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some truth to that, I, I think, but it also, I think, misses uh, uh, some some key points around understanding where our our powers actually lie, and then how do we use those effectively? That I think, you know, uh, for many indigenous communities, particularly in you know North and South America, you, you can't play the numbers game, right? In the same way that the, the some of the left theory articulates it, but there are ways to organize. And so, if you can share some of that. I think it might be helpful in, in how that's related to the, the mind shift that I think is going to be necessary to, to kind of, you know, move this piece forward with the little time I think uh, uh, we kind of have remaining. And I'm saying that because I think there's, there's the time of Mother Earth, you know, and then there's, there's this limited jaded time that we are on. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, within the capitalist dominated society that we live in, and they, they definitely don't align. But I think how we have to figure out how we need to move to, to make sure that our our communities get what they need in this next period is going to be critical. God, I was like, I I got to remember to unmute if I start talking. <laughs> um, no, this, this is a, this is an important question and. It, and it's challenging for me in a, in, to answer in a num in, for a number of reasons. One, um, there's a difference between the organizing of indigenous people in the global South than there is the organizing in the US and Canada context. Um, and and that, that is for a couple of different reasons. The, the colonizing government structures are different, right? The foundation governance structures in the global South or this hemisphere anyway, tends to be Spanish, Spaniard rule. And, and so that's their sort of foundation of governance structure. In the US, it's, you know, some of it was, some of it was Spanish, went to, you know, British rule and then, you know, became independent. So, um, and then the, the, the time frame of con contact here is different in the US than it is further south. Um, and so, you know, in the, in terms of the inside outside strategy, like those other spaces that I like, there's the indigenous Minga space that happens alongside the um, the UN process. Like that's been primarily organized from indigenous peoples in Guatemala, Peru, Brazil, um, and you know that organizing potential um, is definitely something we look at. I know I look at. Um, from a U.S. context, right? And, but here in the U.S., like the tribes were so fractioned from each other. So on the, on the good side, the U.S. government said, we're going to recognize you as independent nations, right? That didn't happen in places like Guatemala, right? They're just like, y'all are, y'all are the primitive, savage indigenous peoples. And that's how they're just grouped together, um, and so that creates a sort of fractions, you know, fracturization of like indigenous peoples in terms of thinking collectively. Now, there is there are definitely indigenous peoples who who you know are connecting and building solidarity um, in a sort of movement context, not like tribal governance context, but in a movement context, and are connecting you know, with indigenous peoples of the global south, but, you know, from North America, US, Canada, 
Alaska. I consider Alaska its own other country. <laughs> I mean, it's part of the U.S., but man, they're big and they they got. I mean, like two hundred some tribes. Oh, right there. Going on, right. <laughs> it's like it's like almost half of the tribes represented in the U.S. are in Alaska alone. Um, and so, for me, you know, when I think about like the mobilization potentiality that we could have. Um, you know, it's exciting and it's challenging, right? One, we, you know, the, our, our population here is dramatically smaller um, uh, as indigenous people in, in our own homeland, right? Versus in Guatemala, like they're a majority, right? They're a majority in, in, in that country. And so the, the, the potentiality of, of mobilization based on that kind of popular mobilization can happen in countries like Brazil and Guatemala and, and other places that just don't have the same sort of popular muscle here and just from sheer numbers. So that's, a, that's just a numbers game when you, you know, gave the example that you did. Um, but the indigenous communities here in the US and Canada and Alaska have used their relationship of the governance structure that was imposed upon us to basically use that function against the government itself, right? <laughs> right? And so if we can be recognized as independent nations different than say in another, in, in another country in the global South, then how do we use that to hold certain spaces and accountability in spaces like the UN, in, in spaces like Congress, right? So you know, in, in Congress, like the U.S. is obligated to certain conditions that they set up when they set up the way that U.S. Tribe, tribes in the U.S. were going to be recognized. Um, so, you know, essentially we can use that structure to hold them accountable to certain things. Mm -hmm. it, you know, for example, like, um, uh, you know, clean water standards. Um, you know, there's the, there's the U.S. sort of version of that, but the tribes, because they can be recognized as sort of independent sovereigns, can have a higher water quality standard, and the U.S. has to meet them at that. Now, they're always trying to undo and unravel that stuff, but the obligation and the structure is there. Um, and so I think, you know, some of those spaces have created opportunities to look at like, where can we merge one, this sort of popular mass movement kind of space to move things. And, you know, the function that like exists in the US and Canada and Alaska to like move certain things. So, you know, coming out of the Cochabamba space, there were a number of people who had participated there and, and in subsequent spaces that came from US Canada and Alaska have now been trying to move though that kind of language to be included in their tribal constitutions. So this concept of rights of nature and rights of mother earth, which has been done in a couple of countries, there are tribes here in the US who are now trying to include that in their constitutions of their tribal nations. So, you know, I think there are shortcomings that we have here in the in the US in terms of mass and scale and being able to like move things in that popular sort of movement space when we say like oh mass mobilizations and at the same time there are also other structural mechanisms that we've been able to move some things farther down the line so i think there's a balance between that i and so when i think about though the inside outside strategy in terms of the UN yeah, there's indigenous peoples that have been leading from those two perspectives, you know, one of like structurally what can happen and what should happen and how that's happening in other countries. So this idea of rights of nature, rights of mother earth, rights of water, right, rights of river, um, that kind of stuff, that, that can happen. And some of that is getting pushed through popular movements in other countries, and some of that is getting pushed through structural function in countries like the US. And so I think those are opportunities for other grassroots communities worldwide to look at like, oh, is can this be possible where we're at? And you know, 
it, it, there's not a, um, a, a blanket model that can work for everyone. Um, and it has to be sort of unique to the, each of the communities. But I think the intention around rights of nature, rights of Mother Earth, um, in relation to human rights is, you know, a good strategy to take and that can get implemented in other countries, however it makes sense to them. Um, so that's what I would say about that. I, I think the other part about the inside outside strategy is, you know, I, I, I so the, the challenging part for me, you know, in this, this COP is, you know, I was representing CJA, which is a multicultural, multi-identity, multi-strategy organization, and I'm an Indigenous woman, right? And so while that is something I'm very proud of, it was really strange and awkward for me when, like, people would do interviews with me about, like, you know, being a co-director of CJA, and then when I would, like, meet with the, whoever the reporter was they would Im immediately pivot to like, oh, well, what about indigenous peoples? Which is cool in one hand, but it's also like, hey, I'm also talking about other communities of color and how this is impacting us. And so one of the common questions that ha would happen is like, well, you know, how do you feel like the representation is for, at this COP for indigenous peoples? Um, and my answer was, was pretty much the same every time is, um, you know, there was, there were health requirements that excluded a lot of people um, worldwide uh, and primarily from the global south though and indigenous people um, who were just not able to attend because they couldn't meet the health requirements. Um, and so that was already a reduction of already a body of people who have a limited representation at the UN anyway, is now then an even smaller component. And they were like, oh, but there's so many people here. And I was like, yeah, but there, there's a difference between people being here and people being heard, right? And so everywhere in the UN, you would see all these pictures of like indigenous peoples, you know, people from Brazil and, and all these like beautiful, colorful pictures and imagery of indigenous peoples on like banners and posters and everything and everywhere, but it doesn't mean they're being heard or listened to, right? They want us to be there because we're like, you know, they're like, oh, the indigenous people are here. And it's like, yeah, you like we're here, but you're not listening to us. There's a difference between getting us in the room and then hearing us in the room, right? Like listening to us and taking direction from us in the room. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like there's a there's some level of window dressing that, you know, that the corporations do and in some way the you know, UN structure itself does around the participation of indigenous peoples. Um, and so we're there and we definitely have lots to say, but once that negotiation happened, it was very few indigenous peoples in that room, much less being heard or having a voice to be heard, right? Because the negotiators from the US are not trying to include indigenous people in that negotiation and and very much were about excluding us from that negotiating room right and so I think that's why we always have to push not only like being inside and having inside strategy but also pushing the the structural function of how decisions are made in that space um, and so it's both like holding the space and then trying to reorganize that space as we're trying to hold our voices in that space. And, and that's, that can be challenging, you know, when you're, you're trying to like make sure your voice is heard in that space. And then you're also trying to de deconstruct that space at the same time. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a challenge. You know, this, just so the, the audience knows, um, the excuse was the pandemic. I'm gonna use my framework. The excuse was the pandemic, you know, to exclude folks. But this was the most, uh, I would argue, intentional exclusionary cop of them all. Uh, and and from the jump, uh, I think it was it was that even before COVID, just in some of the ways in which they were, um, uh, what site they chose. You know, uh, Glasgow is not a major city you know there's not a lot of accommodations 
um, there as it there has been other places like in the past to be able to hold that many people coming in for a duration of time and then you add on all the pandemic stuff there. But, you know, I'm, I'm raising this to go to this point and would like you to talk about this because it seems to be much more of a trend that they're making this, you know, decisively, right? Like from, from my understanding, uh, COP27, and yes, there's going to be another one. Uh, it's several more <laughs> at this point. Um, the next one is going to be in Egypt. And then the one following that, I think, is is in the UAE, right? United Arab Emirates, uh, which for many people, uh, particularly from the African continent, Egypt have, already has a number of variants, particular from folks coming from the South to be able to gain uh, entry to long pre-existing uh, COVID. Uh, and the same goes for the UAE, right? Um, so it's very like the decision makers are very intentionally choosing places which will limit the ability of kind of mass participation and mass mobilization. Um, and it speaks in, in, in smack dab, you know, particularly if you look at um, the, the current social struggles that are taking place, you know, in Egypt. Um, you know, with the, the military basically reinstalling its rule, you know, several years ago. Uh, I know, you know, uh, many uh, comrades I know who have either been disappeared or, or you know, in prison or, or facing on prison terms uh, in Egypt now. So it raises, I know to me, um, a lot of questions about just how should we engage going forward, understanding you know, some of these limitations and the choices that are being made. Um, and, but also, you know, how might we turn this on his head? You know, that's another thing. Like, instead of looking at it as a limitation, could it be a challenge to elevate, you know, a number of different things? And one of the things to just come back to, you know, what I'm hearing many people cite as uh, one of the bright spots of this particular cop was that uh, human rights actually you know, because of our collective pushing, human rights was actually reinserted back into the text. And I want folks to know that this is one of the, for those of you who aren't familiar with the negotiations, you know, um, uh, through the Paris Agreement, they basically, a little bit before, but definitely by the Paris Agreement, which was 2014, if I remember correctly, um, you know, the they removed, <laughs> they removed, human rights from the text. Now, mind you, this is the United Nations, which is supposed to be a body that is, is in theory, you know, set up to, you know, uh, respect, protect, and fulfill, using their language, <laughs> respect and protect and fulfill the human rights uh, uh, all around the globe. But to remove human rights from the document, again, speaks to that nature of how deep the capture is that, that within this institution, human rights, and within these negotiations, human rights were consistently struck from the document, right? And the, all the implications of what that then means and what all the parties who are, who are part of this process, what their, their obligations are to, to shape their policies, as you were saying, Benishi, within a particular set of, of constraints uh, and a, cons a, a set of rules. So I want you to just, you know, we the, the, speak on this possibility of both the limitation and the constraint about how we move for how we should move forward, our social movements should move forward in this in this process, recognizing, you know, that we're gonna need the inside-outside game. Uh, but how do we do it more effectively given uh, uh, some of the limitations that, that clearly seem to be part of their strategy? Dude, that's the million dollar answer right yeah. there, man. I knew that answer, I'd be rich somewhere. <laughs> um yeah, you know. So, yeah, but I, I heard the announcement of the next dates, um, either, I mean, the next locations, either right before I got there <laughs> or right when I got there. It was pretty, it was pretty at the beginning of when I got there. Um, and so I, I either heard the, the, the locations and, and the first thing I thought when I heard the locations, I was like, that's a restricted place. And then the next one was like, oh, that's even a more restrictive place to get to, right? And I was like, whoa, that's kind of scary. 
Um, and, and just from a people popular movement kind of restriction, right? I'm not even like talking about like climate change and like, you know, industry and all of that. I was thinking of just from a popular movement kind of space of people being able to have access for free expression of speech and, and protest and all of that. And so, you know, my, my, um, you know, my organizing style and methodology is also very steeped in being a mother, right? So already my mama hackles were like up, like, oh shoot, like this is gonna be highly intense, possibly dangerous situation, right? And so it's like, how do you think about that and, and hold that and as well as saying, all right, we gotta do, we gotta do what we gotta do. You know, you still gotta go in, you still gotta do what you gotta do. So. Um, so a couple of things um, for me, like, so the restrictive nature of this one, you know, and, and that being couched as, you know, health, health uh, restrictions around COVID, um, you know, was a, a, fairly, a fairly thin veil around restriction and, you know, exclusion of indigenous peoples um, worldwide. Indigenous peoples worldwide, not even just this hemisphere, but worldwide. And because, I mean, e even outside of like climate change, just the access that other countries have had to vaccinations is like grossly, under, like there's countries that are still waiting, you know, and while, you know, the U.S. is like, consuming all of this and, and, and even throwing away vaccinations because they become expired, right? And saying, oh no, we have all the production needs to go to the US. And so they're not going to these other countries. And so, you know, that's already a, a, a racial social system set up um, that, you know, puts, you know, puts grassroots communities at a disadvantage and, and communities um, outside of the US at a dis disadvantage for participating. So, I mean, and, and Kali, you know this, like one of the things that we did back in the summer was we called for a postponement of COP um, for this very reason, saying like, if indigenous peoples and other peoples from the global South, Africa, all these other countries are not able to participate because they don't have access or they have limited access to COVID, COVID vaccines and, and they can't, like we should postpone it. COP, of course, was not trying to hear us say that, but we called for it anyway, saying we need to postpone COP if, if people can't fully participate. They move forward, and because they move forward with business as usual, the largest delegation at COP, the largest badged delegation at COP was oil and gas lobbyists. Oil and gas lobbyists outnumbered Indigenous people's I think something like four or five to one. Um, they had the largest delegation of any country worldwide, the largest delegation of any indigenous peoples from any of the countries. This is the business as usual intention that I'm saying is like palpable for, for being there. So when it, think about like organizing going forward, you know, one, you know, our grassroots communities are going to do what they need to do to make the connections and, and, and to, you know, be brave and continue to go in the, into these spaces. And we're going to do that. And we're going to continue to do the things that we need to do by saying these injustices are happening even prior to getting into COP, you know, around restrictions of who can get badged and not get badged. We're going to continue to call out that process and call out the UN process for that. Um, and, and, you know, that is challenging because it's sometimes at risk of our own um, approval of being in those spaces, right? So it's like both balancing that of like, you know, saying, hey, we're going to, you know, challenge the UN around their process for who gets approved or not get approved. And that means we can also not get approved <laughs> um, as an organization, or you can get blacklisted as an organization. I hate that term, but that's even what they call it, and it's it's it, it's terrible. Um, but a couple of things happen 
um, one, um, Chantel and I, um, Chantel Bingham, who's from CJA and um, is doing our Black organizing outreach at Climate Justice Alliance, her and I had an opportunity to meet with some of the organizing group um, from Africa. They're excited, you know, one, they're excited about it being there. Um, they're already, they're already organizing, right? They're, they're organizing, right? They were organizing as we were still at COP, getting ready to go for Egypt. And so um, feeling optimistic about that and, and, you know, building that relationship. And that's what it takes is like us finding the sort of grassroots base in these places and building and building that solidarity with them. Uh, I will be honest to say that the UAE is probably the farthest reach of anybody we have relationship with, um, but we're going to still look look for that relationship. We have some a deeper, you know, some budding relationship, and some um, some of our members and member organizations have some deeper relationships with groups um, um, in Africa as a whole continent, but also going further north. Um, and, and, and doing that, building out that relationship right now in, in terms of heading into Egypt. I think we're always going to still have to advocate for those other peoples that we have relationship with that are not in the U.S. So for CJA, you know, that has meant, you know, some of our CJA membership are international organizations and they have relationship with people in other countries. And so, although CJA is not an international organization, you know, we try to support and uplift the membership of our members. Um, so for example, IEN, Indigenous Environmental Network, you know, they have relationship with those in Guatemala and Brazil and, and, and Ecuador and other countries. Um, and going to continue to advocate for their participation and and both in the UN space, but also resourcing the work that's happening in those communities um, from US, you know, US-based foundations who should be supporting them. And, um, and so that's going to happen, but also like then how can we help facilitate that relationship between those communities and the next two countries that we're going into? Um, um, Egypt and and the UAE and 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 figuring out like the organizing the grassroots organizing so that those parallel spaces can continue to happen. Um, you know, in Glasgow, we even still we saw a pretty huge um, police presence um, in in the city of Glasgow while we were there, and you know a lot of the community people, citizens there were also really surprised of like how much police presence was there. Um, the hostel that we stayed at was um, on the same block as, or a half a block anyway, from the, the one of the largest utility companies in Scotland. And they had an action there. Um, and, and there were, I'm, I'm sure there were others, but this one evening they had an action there was like six, six or seven protesters, like a very small number of protesters. They were, it was a, just a small little group. And um, there were at least 40 police there for, you know, what was no more than 10 people at this small protest. And I was just like, wow, this is crazy. You know, it's just crazy. And the street where our hostel was at, we realized they were, you know, had it staged um, during the march as a sort of kettle kind of area. I don't know if people know what that, what kettling is, is where you like can block in a group of people into a space where they have no exit retreat, right? Like, and where our hostel was at, we realized that had been during the march, a space for kettling people. They didn't on that space, but they did somewhere else. They had kettled in a small group of the march um, into an area and had a couple of arrests or like detained people for a few hours, but but, you know, they expected 10,000 people from this march is what I understood. And I think the march was 100, 100 150,000 people. Um, so it was good. And, you know, when you think about that, like, 
you know, there, yes, there were people from other countries, but that also means that of those 100, 150,000 people, the majority of that was Europe, European. It was people from Scotland. It was from people from other European countries because they had the closest access to get there. Um, and so, you know, while I have all my feelings about colonization, that was a hopeful thing for me to see um, that, you know, 100,000 people of which a good large majority of them were um, non-people of color, that I'm like, all right, they're thinking about this too. They're thinking about climate change. This is urgent for them. You know, we may have a difference of strategies and approaches, and um, but it was a sliver of optimism for me. I wouldn't say I'm like totally, <laughs> so, but it was a sliver of optimism for me to, to see that happening. And I was like, wow, this is cool. Like, and you know, the, the people of Scotland, for sure, I was definitely had some different thinking once I was there, just about their own relationship with British rule. Um, and, you know, their own sort of thinking about decolonization. I was like, that was that was learning opportunity for me. Yeah, there's for those for those who don't know, there is a very active Scottish independence movement. Um, which uh, almost won a vote um, for independence about mm -hmm. six years back. Um, and there's some ongoing referendum questions that still have a lot of uh, mass support there um, uh, that I think is going to come in even sharper focus um, now that all the, the, the promises of Brexit, um, you know, that Boris uh, and the Conservative Party were pumping into folks uh, are clearly not coming to pass. Um, uh, matter of fact, I think he just lost a special election, or the party just lost a special election. Not to a group that's that much better, but um, you know, it does represent a, a, a shift. Um, you know, but we 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 have complicated history with with the Scottish folks and the, the Scotch Irish folks. Uh, you know who. Um, were the shock troops, you know, invading your homelands, and particularly the Scotch Irish folks, um, you know, all that old Daniel Boone, all that other you know madness that they uh, preach, like that's who that's that's the stock that folks came from, um, you know. But uh, deeper questions of the global nature of how these systems work that I think we always kind of got to keep in mind. Um, but I want to open it up, um, you know, just in the short time we have remaining. If there's anyone, um, you know, has any questions for Benishi, uh, you know, the, the, the floor is yours. Um, you know, we'll, we'll take a few uh, questions before coming to a close. And you can either put the questions in the chat and I can read them or with the, the size of the group we have now, folks can just ask questions directly. While I'm waiting, while we're waiting for people to form their questions, I just want to say, hi, Walda. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see your name, even if I can't see your face. Oh, you're on mute, Walda. Yeah, you're on mute, Walda. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> I wasn't saying anything useful. It was just, hi, Benishi, and hey, Kali, and... Hey, how you doing? Uh, Co-op, I'm good, and this was a good conversation. Just, just appreciating it, and you know, I guess the the question I have is, do you all see any possibility now that the climate crisis and is becoming almost a mainstream question, right? And these, you know white bourgeois type scientists are saying, you know, we just got a few years left. I mean, is there any motion or sense that we can build a really broad movement for Mother Earth? I don't know humanity? if it's just me or it's, it's the wall. No, I can uh, hear her fine. Your um, Wi-Fi might be maybe. skipping a bit, but I heard Walda fine. Okay. Did you finish that question, Walda? I did. I did. You know, you kind of know the question. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, I feel like there is some opportunity. I mean, I I feel like it's on the forefront of people's mind, but I don't know if I feel like the urgency is there, mm -hmm. right? So there, sure. there's this, there's this sort of, it's in this sort of popular sphere, and then there's not urgency. The the flip side of not opportunity, but the danger of where we're in right now is because it's becoming popular, it's becoming popular in the wrong ways, right? So in the wrong ways being um, people, again, this sort of the fixes are economic based. Um, um, and so there's a, a co-optation of um language around environmental justice um around like oh we're gonna we're gonna do this um carbon technology you know carbon sequestration technology that is going to pollute in this community but we're still going to call it environmental justice or climate justice right and so there's there's that danger that is happening and we're seeing that a lot more in the this la last year it's been for a while but a lot more aggressively in the last year because I've been hearing it both in in media in magazines in philanthropy and in other spaces right and so um, at the UN nature-based solutions was the buzz word this year you know where a few years back we you know in in movement spaces it had pushed back really hard against um, reds you know um, I always forget the acronym for REDS, the degradation, deforestation, reducing emissions through degradation and deforestation. <laughs> I'm like, God dang, I hate these technical terms sometimes. But, you know, we pushed back against no REDS. That then became a, a reason for corporations to use this idea of nature-based solutions, right? And so the concept that, like, you can continue to pollute as long as you invest in offsets in a forest somewhere else or, you know, in other technologies to do offsets. It doesn't address the actual production of carbon, right? It just says, you got enough money, you can do these offsets. So that's the dangerous time that we're in right now is, is that even though there's sort of people's attention on it, they're being sold the idea that these offsets are the answer. I think from, for me anyway, from a grassroots space, frontline space is, those will never be viable answers unless we deal with the production to begin with, because it'll, they will never offset enough of what already exists right now. And if we continue to produce it, they will just never be able to catch up. So I, um, I'm good with that question. Um, I see Judy and then Eleanor. Yes, hi, Vishen. Thank you so much uh, for doing this today. Um, I, some of what you were saying earlier about, uh, you know, moving into more of a biodiverse uh, type of wind down kind of system take, makes total sense. And I think it's the only way forward. So let me first say that. Um, I am in Canada and I'm with a group that's now supporting the Wet'suwet'en um, I don't know how much you're familiar with that uh, particular situation, but we have basically military forces going into indigenous land. Um, and part of the strategy is attacking or at least divesting in financial systems, like in the banking system and stuff, which um, I guess for me, I see that as a practical thing for now because you have to do something to get CGL out of this immediate circumstance. But I think the ideal solution is land back and indigenous sovereignty over land. And the problem I have with divesting fuel, fossil fuel, is that what I'm seeing is that as like pension plans transition, they're saying, okay, the money's not in fossil fuels, but we're going to put it into green technologies. So what we're also seeing in Canada is a lot more of these mining exploration licenses being issued. And um, 
so we've already approved the lithium mine for electric vehicles, for example. Unfortunately, most of these mining projects that are being explored at the moment are also on indigenous lands. So even though we can ask for divesting in fossil fuels, we end up in, in maybe even a worse situation that these lands then become the bedrock of mining. So the only way I see uh, moving forward is moving more towards like rights for mother earth, things like that. Um, and the other thing that's happening now um, is I'm part of a group called the ISDS Consortium. And we're doing an inside out kind of thing, looking at the G7 for trade agreements. And so they're also looking at the concept of using the Sherpas at the G7 to deliver the legal framework for the ISDS, but uh, and then to try and leverage grassroots movements to basically push for the complete elimination of ISDS. So we have all these mechanisms, the patent laws, the ISDS, the ECT, that help to support multinational corporations have legal rights over nation states. And I'm just wondering if you have anything to say to that and maybe around organizing, like the other thing we're doing uh, with the wet sweat and is trying to build settler um, community support for First Nations. So we have what they're, they're calling it an affinity group at the moment. And so if you could give maybe some tips on how to help promote those types of initiatives, I'd appreciate it. I don't know, I said a lot there, sorry. <laughs> well, that was good, Judy, thank you. <laughs> that was a lot, that was good, that was a lot. Um, I'm gonna sit with that last one for a minute though, and maybe it'll come to me by the time I'm done talking about the others. Um, you know, with the, with the, you with this last um, COP that we were at, you know, one of the um, alliances that we stayed in close relationship or have close relationship with is um, Indigenous Climate Action, um, which is the sort of sister organization to Indigenous Environmental Network in Canada. You know, I mean, IEN is based in the U.S. and um, ICA is based in Canada. And so um, really, you know, worked with their, they, you know, I had a delegation of young people and, and others who were there. Um, and the West and um, efforts were definitely very present for us um, there. So I would just want to say that I think in terms of the, you know, like thinking about like the divestment, like this is why the the sort of inside outside strategy is important for that UN space, right? Because not only were there people being in, you know, in these the panels and discussions inside and, um, and even some actions inside, you know, we did a number of actions around, um, you know, the sort of false solutions and denouncing false solutions. Um, but one of the outside actions we did was against JP Morgan um, and, and one of their big headquarters spaces that was there in Glasgow. Um, and it wasn't just JP Morgan, but um, the, the sort of transnational corporations who have their hand in this, right? And one of the interviews I did very early on was this announcement of this like, uh, Kali, you might remember this number. I don't know if I get the, I'm terrible at remembering numbers, but it was something like $40 billion was going to be invested from these banks and corporations into, into renewable energy or into false uh, climate change solutions. And somebody interviewed me about it and asked me, you know, what I thought about it. And I was like, cool, I guess. Like, it doesn't mean it's going to get to grassroots communities. It doesn't, you know, and it's a drop in the bucket in terms of what they're earning from their investments into fossil fuel industry, <laughs> right? Like these are the same corporations who are investing in fossil fuel industry and who are gaining revenues from that and are saying, all right, but we're going to use the small chunk of money to do renewables. And so, yeah, you know, it's hard to say like, oh, like 
I'm not excited about $40 billion. It's more money than any of us ever will see. But it is a reality that 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 kind of money and investment is not going into grassroots community. It's not going into local solutions. It's going into their further ownership of energy sources, including renewables, for their own profit and benefit, right? And, and so, you know, much of the renewable energy technology that has been developed in the last 40 years, a good number of those patents have been bought up by corporations like BP and Exxon, right? And, and part, you know, who could tell you what their intentions were? From my point of view, their intentions were hold those technologies as a stall to like, let's stall this because we want to like continue to profit as much as we can off of the fossil fuels while we can, because that's a cheaper energy source. And then two, whenever the time comes, we own those technologies and then we'll implement them and then that'll be our new energy source, right? So it's like, it's a twisted system, but they have, they bought up a bunch of patents for technologies. So the, the corporations are complicit in what is happening. And even though there's an investment into renewables, it's not an investment that is going to locally held economic development. It's going to large mainstream multinational economic investment, right? And that's a system that is not going to sustain us. That's a system that will continue to be extractive and exploitive of the land and of the people. So much so that we have public safety systems that are actually not protecting the public well-being of the people and instead protecting the well-being of oil and gas industry, right? So the situation at West Suetin is you have this large police and military presence protecting oil and gas development, right? They're protecting the industry. They're not protecting the actual citizens and people of that area, which is what they're supposed to do as public safety officers, instead are, are protecting the corporations. I live in a state where it's illegal, it is illegal to protest oil and gas infrastructure. I can be fined $10,000 and serve up to 10 years in prison um, for that. If I go under the banner of an organization, that organization can be fined $100,000. Now, you know, there are people who are challenging that as whether or not it's constitutional or not, but that exists in this state. I also live in a state that has a statewide day of prayer for oil fields. You heard that right. Oil fields. It's like October 12th or something. Let's October 15th is like, let's pray for the oil fields. You believe that? Like that is some crazy, like mind blowing perspective of this is the society that we live in as US, Canada context, world context even. And it, show, it shows up in spaces like the UN like, and like Holly said, that are supposed to be about the protection of human rights and instead have led with policies that is about the protection of the economic viability of fossil fuel industry. So much so that they're like, all right, let's make sure that they're their largest delegation at this most recent call. Now, in terms of organizing around those systems and structures, I mean, <coughs> in terms of the investment part, <coughs> I mean, I, that was one of the reasons why I said it was important for us to continue to participate at the UN is really just around countering that voice that is a dominant voice in the COP process, right? The Conference of the Parties, which we were calling the Conference of the Profiteers. Um, you know, the, that we have to have be that counter of that voice, both in the UN space, but also in our national government spaces. I mean, is it called the same thing in Canada? Is it still called federal in Canada? I think it's called something else, but um, but in the US in the like federal sphere, right? Like how are we countering that? And I think we always have to do and call out the investment of these banks and corporations. So JP, JP Morgan is just one of them along with Chase and other, you know, multinational financial institutions about their investment. And we have to call them out. Um, and continue to do that on a regular basis.
I, yeah, I don't know if I got to that very last question of yours, but hopefully that was enough. And I'm happy to like, I'm gonna put my email in the in the chat. People okay, want to like ask me about thank this. You, thing, thank you. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we'll go to our last question from. Sorry about that. Um, Ju oh, Eleanor. Eleanor. Hi. So just a caveat briefly, I have to go for another meeting in 10 minutes. So if I jump off while you're responding to this question, I, I really apologize. Um, okay. Thank you so much for, uh, for, your, for your talk today and your report back. Um, I was really struck by the fact that the fossil fuel industry was able to so disproportionately, you know, so overrepresent themselves through COVID-19 and the vaccine apartheid that we're experiencing globally. And it occurred to me that this problem isn't really likely to go away at future COP meetings. I mean, I, su I suppose we, we hope it would be that COP becomes more uh, accessible to indigenous people and people from the global south who are at the front lines of climate change and who obviously have the solutions that we actually need uh, to combat it. And, um, you know, but at the same time, it's as climate change is getting worse, it's making it more and more difficult for those people to be present at this major global summit. So I was wondering if you had participated in conversations about this in your work, um, especially since, um, you know, since COP happened this year, uh, and what you think the right strategies are for addressing that. You know, you sort of mentioned this inside outside strategy. I'm sure that's a part of it. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just occurring to me that this this whole process is only going to get more and more difficult as people who are already not privileged by this system are able are un, are able to travel less and less. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the concept of the right to self-determination is, is not exclusive to just indigenous people. Like that's for all people. Like we have a right to sort of self-determine. And so, you know, I'm I, like, that's, that's a core value for me. And, you know, when I think about like, what is going to happen going forward? Um, you know, if for this past, like this past year, one of the things that the the UN said was like, oh, well, those communities who don't have um, access to vaccines, um, we'll make sure that whoever applies to be a delegate will get them vaccinated, right? Um, you know, which on the which on the surface seems like the right thing to do, but what does that mean for the rest of the community who has no access, right? Who has no access? But however that access needs to happen and and, and the desire for that happen has to be grounded in those communities to say what they want, right? What they want in terms of vaccine or their health or their like how they want that managed. And whatever that is should be accepted by the UN because people have as a human right, the right to self-determination, right? <laughs> it was like, and so I think the challenge for us is like, how do we support that happening? How do we prepare? Um, uh, yeah, or so we wish, you would think that was the way it was going. Um, and, but how do we prepare? You know, one, we know the challenges of this year. And so, and, and just so people are clear, like the challenges were this, it, you had to be vaccinated beforehand. You had to be tested immediately before boarding the flight. You had to be tested once you were on the ground in 
in, in Scotland. And then you had to have daily tests for um, daily tests for uh, COVID to go in any of the UN spaces or in any of the parallel spaces actually as well. So on the, on the good side of like Scotland was handing out these like COVID tests, like you could get them for free, right? Mm-hmm. We, we weren't sure what was going to happen. So our delegation bought some tests for our delegation to have tests um, at a great deal of cost. It was fairly expensive even to buy that stuff in the U.S. and take them with us for our delegation of 60 people. A lot of money. Let me just say it was a lot. I was shocked how much money it was as well. And then we get to Scotland and they're just like, oh, here, here's a box of tests. Y'all make sure you get tested. Make sure. And I was just like, wow, this is really cool that like we can be in a country that they're like, make sure you get tested and like giving that stuff out freely wherever. And not just because the UN was there. They had a whole internal system of how to like upload the results and all of that. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. So um, and as challenging as it was for us to like make sure we were prepared going to Scotland, um, we were coming from one of the wealthiest countries in the nation, right? Mm-hmm. And, and understanding that privilege of even, even to be able to like afford the cost to like get the test for our crew beforehand and, you know, the test that we had to take before and once we landed, those are a different test and they're more expensive um, test. Um, we definitely are sitting in a place of privilege in terms of other countries being able to have the economic resources to do that and other like the representatives from other countries. Um, and so in addition to that, if you had a positive test result, you had to stay isolated for 14 days in Scotland. <laughs> um, and, you know, and it, do people have the means to be able to do that? And what does that mean for their families economically back home? So these are the things that we have to like think about and prepare for and, and figure out how we can from organizations and networks and movements from one of the wealthiest countries in the world to be able to support our allies who are holding some really strong organizing strategy and strength to be able to help support them of where they're at to do that. Um, And one of those ways is to hold the UN accountable to um, making sure that like policies are not exclusive, you know, exclusionary for people. And, but it's like Holly said, the, the, the practice of excluding people um, was veiled as health restrictions, um, but really it's, it, it's an intention around like who they want to be at the table um, in those discussions. So we're gonna continue to have to do that and, and we'll continue to do that. But, you know, knowing that the real intention is around making sure that frontline people are not in the room. <laughs> um, and we're gonna still muscle our way in the room. Uh, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'm normally in these about 1.30 East Coast time, but I see one more hand. <laughs> we'll try to do it quick. Okay. <laughs> All right, HD. All right, HD. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you both for doing this uh, lovely interview. Um, I can't put my uh, screen on because I'm on my phone. I don't have internet. Um, but uh, not speaking directly to the COP26, but to something that you brought up earlier in your answer to one of the earlier questions uh, got me thinking in terms of building grassroots movements in response to these broad capital run nation state projects of how to essentially capitalize on climate change. Um, How do we approach building, because self-determination is a matter of not just for indigenous people, but for all people. It's, you know, especially coming from a social ecological perspective, all communities need to have that type of, the same type of food justice and access to uh you know not poisonous soil and you know not living in a food desert living being able to you know have infrastructure that supports this community and is directly tied into an ecological uh forward moving thing 
and the the concept that you you know particularly thinking about Scotland right and how their history of colonialism within Europe and then bringing and then the connection between them and the colonial times them being the often the you know the Scotch Irish as not just the Scotch Irish but many of those peoples who were most brutally colonized in Europe then became the most brutal colonizers in the Americas and that applies you know both to not just to ethnic groups but to classes within Spain and, and so on um and you know thinking about that in terms of not just those colonial waves but also you know the vast majority of people here on the east coast at least at least where i live are people who came who, whose ancestors came within the last hundred years literally as refugees from one war or genocide or imperialism or another um how do we approach building these kinds of non because i think there's a problem with a lot of the times usually and i don't want to mischaracterize but often you know middle class white environmental movements try to seek a like a messianic allyship in build putting all of their hopes in indigenous and black movements and instead of realizing that like if you make up this majority of the country you have to do much of the same work uh in building that and i think there's a, a, a sort of a cultural problem not just in the you know the class base uh, part of it but also in the you know the poor the poor people in much of the world and particularly in the quote unquote west have been dispossessed for 500 years there's been you know from capital enclosures in primitive accumulation beginning within europe into the quote unquote you know in the americas quote unquote uh there are people who have 500 years of not having had an actual commons so to speak and so haven't ha have been so desocialized into private accumulation or at best being you know and we see it very often the poorest people become the vanguard of the state of of capital of because they are so reliant upon it because they haven't had that whereas for many other peoples there there has been they have a, a a relatively recent ancestral memory of a commons of connection with the earth and so on and where you know this and this is a very thing they can rely they can draw upon this history to build something whereas so how do how do we bridge that gap how do we not just bridge a gap but to like essentially get uh and again it's not exclusively poor whites i'm thinking of but there you know that's a big big proportion of the poor people within no, the at least the north american context or the you know north american turtle island etc context um and also i guess uh the the quote-unquote latin america as well that is also the case people you know people who descend from people who have again not had you know a commons in 500 or 400 years and there that, that that creates a psychological and cultural and economic repercussion that echoes down into colonialism right so how do you get people to realize that if you know it can't just be middle class and upper class white activists transferring what privilege they have and just really hoping that indigenous people can save us all um how do we you know how, how do we how do we move forward and bridge that gap and like really activate people who have been and like re re commons people who have been uncommonsed for lack of a better term for so yeah. long so i will try to answer and i you know i thank those who are indulging this extra few minutes here um and so if I understand the question right. Um, I'm gonna um, try to answer it from the context of where I live. So I'm in Oklahoma, um, belly of the beast of oil and gas development, right? Those whole state's cultural identity is based on oil um, development and all that. And so, and then there's a, there's a small portion of our history that is about indigenous peoples being re relocated here. But the majority of the state is um, white, poor 
white is probably the largest majority of socioeconomic sort of identity here in Oklahoma. Um, and, you know, when I think about, you know, when I, uh, prior to being here in Tulsa, I was in a very small rural community. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the main primary um, sources of work is in oil fields um, or, or the prison industrial complex, right? Those are the two main job opportunities in rural Oklahoma is either work in a prison or work in an oil field. Um, so there's a whole different workshop to like go through on that stuff. But, you know, when I, when I talk to people about like what's important to them, you know, poor white folks, working class white folks in those rural communities, you know, people can tell you lots of things about like, you know, where their grandpa took them fishing and, you know, where their family farm used to be and, you know, all of this stuff, you know, and, and it's very much about place and land, right? But they've been sold this idea that that idea of place and land is contrary to their economic opportunity for advancement right so this idea of like the only way I can get out of being poor is to buy in a hundred percent into a capitalist system right and so that idea then helps spur um you know why there's a hundred percent backing of that community to say that somebody like you know Donald Trump can be elected president because it's not about his political, you know, prowess or expertise. It's about the opportunity for advancement up the sort of economic scale. And so, you know, when I think about like talking to people about climate change in Oklahoma, um, I usually start from a place of, you know, what do they love about living in Oklahoma? And I would say 90% of the time, it's that response is in relationship to land, right? So you end up having these sort of mini conversations about like land and the importance of that and who takes care of it and whose responsibility is it to take care of and, and thinking about that. And people start, you know, questioning like, you know, what the systems are. Now I'm not I'm not converting anybody from being a capitalist to socialist or something else. I'm not like you know these are just mini conversations, but for me I have been able to see like where people have been sold this myth of um their their being stuck at the bottom of a socioeconomic sort of structure of being poor white people is caused by other brown people right and it's not about like the social structure of like class and exploiting workers and exploiting land it's about like the other i mean we all know this but in oklahoma is like a pretty serious like uh social economic sort of breakdown of that is here exists here and here in oklahoma um and so i think to move through that is to, you know, try to appeal to people's nostalgia around um, their own history of being connected to the land. That's easy to do in a place like Oklahoma because it, it, there's still large rural communities. People still have a memory of farming. Much of the farming has, has shifted to larger commercial farming here um, in Oklahoma. Um, but people still have a memory of that. And so it's like, how can we um, build relationship about that and about water and access to water um, as a sort of connection point and like try to move to that. But you're right, like, you know, this is a, a, a group of people who have long been detached from this idea of the commons and have, um, have long lived in a society that has taught them that opportunity is an individual effort, not a social structure, right? So like, if they're not getting rich, it's because of their own fault. It, and it has nothing to do with, you know, we need you to permanently be a poor working class community. <laughs> um, and so, 
I think we have to like find opportunities to like connect that um, work and, and it exists. I, I, for me, I feel like it exists along the South um, part of the US. You know, I know it exists in other places, but it exists along the South. And, you know, Oklahoma, strangely enough, has a history of a socialist uprising in the around 1917, 18, somewhere in there you know, called the Green Corn Rebellion, which was um, poor white farmer, sharecroppers, black sharecroppers, and indigenous, you know, land holding people here, farmers who started organizing together around a shift to corporate, um, you know, the individual ownership of land and, and, and shifting to that. And much of those laws that were initiated that during that time around, like, congregations or groups of people not meeting together um, still exist on the books, right? They're, they don't get enforced anymore, but they still exist in a lot of the townships of like, you know, you can't have six people congregating outside of a church um, for fear that it was, you know, a sort of socialist meeting or a communist meeting. Um, but those histories exist here and along the South. And, um, and so it's like, how do we have those conversations with people um, when they have been sold this idea that like, oh, you know, socialism is a dirty word, you know, but they can tell you those histories of their grandpa, their, their grandparents being part of those rebellions. They just don't talk about them outside of their home because there was a time when people were arrested for that. We're coming into a time again where people get arrested for that kind of stuff. But I think there's opportunities there to have those conversations and, and to think about what does it look like to have shared community space. And so, you know, when I'm thinking about the sort of solutions, climate change solutions, I think many of those have economic opportunities, but only if they're held locally. So doing a solar installation um, in Oklahoma, but that is held by a community or maybe a county or a couple counties where that resource stays within the county and then the money stays within the counties, then I think that works. And right here, you know, Oklahoma has a huge wind farm on the western part of the state. And it's owned by Chesapeake, who is the main oil and gas <laughs> developer in, in Oklahoma. So it's like, eh, you know, that's not going to community. It's still going to the same corporation. Um, anyway. I don't know if I totally answered your question, but that's what your question made me think of. There's a lot more that we can touch on. We'll, we'll come back to some of that. I think what you uh, asked HD, um, and I see your, your, your point um, uh, in the chat. Um, you know, uh, some aspects of social solidarity we have to remember have not always been exclusively land-based. There are other ways in which folks have, have kind of built common identities, um, uh, largely in diaspora, um, that, that were based upon uh, shared ancestry or shared beliefs. So there's different ways to get at that, I think. But the piece of, of uh, how the colonization process um, reshaped our cultures and minds is a deep one that we got to uh, figure out, you know, because uh, there was some hard bargain struck the dehumanized folks in the process of becoming settlers that I think uh, we got to do some work to deconstruct to get people to support uh, decolonization in, in, a, in not just rhetorical ways, but in, in real political and material ways. So, uh, but Manishi, I want to thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be doing uh, our next uh, session um, uh, with Monica Atkins, also with the Climate Justice Alliance. That is going to be uh, Friday, uh, January 14th. Uh, that's going to be at uh, 2 o'clock that day, 2 o'clock East Coast time, uh, 1 Central time, 12 Mountain time, and 11 uh, Pacific time for those who want to join us and for folks listening to the recording uh, as we put it out. 
uh, on behalf of the Institute for Social uh, Ecology. I want to thank all of you for participating and look forward to more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing Monica. One of these days, you might get all three of us on there and you see what kind of conversation. Oh, you, you, you beat me to it. But I'm, I'm, I'm working for that. I was thinking about doing that sometime in the, in the spring before we another cycle of things pick up to both kind of promote, uh, but also to help ground. So be on the lookout for that. Yeah, and just and for you all that don't know, Climate Justice Alliance has three co-directors, three women of color. So <laughs> Monica is one of them, I myself, and then Marion G. And so, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what kind of, I mean, we have these talks all the time, but yeah, it was good to be here with everyone. It's good to see some familiar faces and new faces and happy to check in again. Take care, y'all. Thanks. Thank